under the Vaccine Act, you cannot sue a vaccine company for injuring you, no matter how negligent they were, no matter how reckless they were, no matter how grievous your injury, you cannot sue them. The only exception to that is if they knew of an injury that is caused by their vaccine and they failed to list it on their manufacturer's insert. All vaccines that are recommended, officially recommended for children get liability protection, even if an adult gets that vaccine. That's why they're going after kids. But the double blind uh, controlled trial is what's used for the initial approval of virtually all vaccines to my knowledge. And, and we live in, in 2021, in most of the of the Western world, in a in a place where we don't have to think about deaths from measles or deaths from diarrhea or pediatric pneumonia deaths, so you kind of have that luxury. So it's all out of sight, out of, out of mind. Welcome to the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. Quick note: if you're interested in an in person event, I have one January 20th in Nashville. It's a Q and A. Come ask about the podcast, starting your own business, psychedelics, health, diet, whatever you want. I'm super excited to see you guys there. Bit nervous, should be really fun. It's linked below or there are tickets at Zany's, Zany's Comedy Club in Nashville. Just type in Michaela Zany's, it'll pop up. In this episode of Opposing Views, where I host two experts to give their opposing views on issues, we talk about vaccines. This is a big one. In this episode, I had Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Amish Adalja on to discuss the safety of vaccines, more specifically COVID-19 vaccines. Since you're probably wondering, yes, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the son of the late Senator Robert F. Kennedy and nephew of the late President John F. Kennedy. He's now the chairman of Children's Health Defense and author. His latest book is titled The Real Anthony Fauci. So you know, it's gonna be interesting. He's already a New York Times bestselling author for works like Crimes Against Nature. Overall, his reputation as a defender of the environment and children's health precedes him. Amish Adalja, on the other hand, is a senior scholar at the John Hopkins Center for Health Security, whose work is focused on emerging infectious disease, pandemic preparedness, and biosecurity. Dr. Adalja has served on US government panels to develop guidelines for the treatment of infectious disease emergencies, as well as an external advisor to the New York City Health and Hospital Emergency Management Training Program for highly infectious diseases like anthrax. The three of us covered a range of topics, including childhood vaccination, recommended vaccine schedules in the US, safety of vaccines, vaccine additives, injuries from vaccines, the different types of vaccines, and more. It was really interesting to have both sides on maybe the most hotly debated topic on the planet right now. You don't want to miss this. And remember, hit subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. Before we jump into this podcast, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you're looking for someone to talk to or a therapist, BetterHelp might be what you want. You've probably heard of them. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with a professional therapist in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely and online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas, especially nowadays. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to awkwardly sit in the waiting room as you normally would. BetterHelp is committed to making great therapeutic matches possible, so they make it easy to change therapists if you ever want to. Sometimes there's some sketchy therapists out there, but not with BetterHelp. Not to mention it's way more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials. They're posted daily and can be extremely helpful in choosing a therapist. They have a special offer for our listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Peterson and join over 2 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of experienced professionals. That's betterhelp, as in H-E-L-P, dot com slash Peterson. That's betterhelp, as in H-E-L-P, dot com slash Peterson, or just use promo code Peterson for 10% off. Enjoy the episode. Robert Kennedy, welcome to my podcast. Pleasure to meet you, Michaela. 
Uh, before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are, if anyone doesn't know who you are and what you do? I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I'm the president of Children's Health Defense, or the chairman of Children's Health Defense. And I, I am the recent author of a book that comes out next week called The Real Tony Fauci, Real Anthony Fauci. Okay, that's going to be, that's going to stir up some trouble probably. Um, okay, I'm going to run through a list of questions um, and I'll just get right into it. Um, what are your views on the uh, safety of vaccines just in general? Uh, well, you know, you have to answer that question one at a time because um, each vaccine has different characteristics and each and for each one, they, you know, you have to measure the, the advisability of that, the vaccine based upon the efficacy and safety profile of that product and, and then the risk of the infectious disease that it's trying to prevent. The problem with um, most of the vaccines currently, all of the vaccines currently, um, mandated the 72 doses of 16 vaccines currently mandated for children under the CDC schedule is that none of them have been properly safety tested. Vaccines are exempt from preclinical trials that do double blind placebo testing, the kind of testing that we apply to every other medical product of vaccines don't uh, are not required to do that testing. So we don't know the risks of any of the vaccines currently mandated for our children. I actually sued the HHS in 2018 to, for, because for many years, I, I've been saying that vaccines aren't safety testing and they've been saying, yes, they are. And um, so I sued them in 2018 after you saying, Give, show me a single safety testing, preclinical, pre-licensed for safety testing for any vaccine that is currently mandated for children. And after a year and a half of litigation, HHS admitted that yes, it had never safety tested any of the vaccines. And because they're not safety tested, we don't know the risk profile. Oh, nobody can say with any kind of scientific certainty whether any of those products are averting more injuries and deaths than they're causing. And there's a lot of indication that many of those products are actually causing more death and injuries than they are preventing. Are some of the vaccines, so you mentioned there's a difference in safety and effic efficacy between vaccines given to children. Um, are there ones that are that you've seen that are definitely more risky than others? Yeah, I'd say any of the vaccines that have aluminum in them are vaccines that are <coughs> that have negative risk profiles. So I think probably the most dangerous of the current vaccines are the hepatitis B vaccine. Um, both Merck's product and Glaxo's and the Gardasil. Prior to the COVID vaccines, the Gardasil vaccines had the worst risk profile. And if you look at, you know, one of the metrics we can use is the vaccine adverse event reporting system, which is the surveillance, the post licensure surveillance system, post marketing surveillance system or vaccine injuries. Unfortunately, that system is also not reliable. HHS's own study in 2010, it's called the Lazarus study, found that that system captures fewer than 1% of vaccine injuries. So, you know, really HHS has no idea how many people are being killed or injured by these vaccines. But we can tell that the Gardasil vaccine compared to other vaccine, many, many, many other people are reporting injuries, uh, very, very bad injuries and deaths. And they're, you know, and they're also winning those cases in some cases in the vaccine courts. Um, so I would say those are probably the two, two of the worst vaccines. 
Okay. What about all, I know there was a lot of media coverage about the MMR vaccine and potential dangers, potential dangers associated with it, but you think that's less of an issue than the hep B and Gardasil vaccines? Yeah, I think, I mean, the MMR does not have any metals in it. Um, there's a lot of injuries reported in association with the MMR, but the MMR is also given to kids who are a little bit older. You know, it's recommended before 36 months, which is three years of age. So a lot of people, a lot of kids are getting it between 18 and 36. And they're a little less vulnerable to vaccine injury at that point. But there's a lot of injuries that are associated with it. Is there a better time to vaccinate kids rather than right away? Like if you wait until kids are three or five, does it lower the risk of vaccine injury? You know, there's a lot of countries that, I mean, we have the most aggressive vaccine schedule of any country. And the countries that have um, a wait a little longer, um, some of the Scandinavian countries and Japan, et cetera, have much appear to have much lower levels of chronic diseases than the United States. There's a there, you know, we're we are having today a chronic disease epidemic in our country. Um, we have we've gone from in 1940, we had six percent of our children had chronic disease by 1986. 12.8% or 11.8% of kids had chronic disease. And by 2006, 54%. So chronic disease, by, by that I mean neurodevelopmental disorders, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, tics, narcolepsy, um, Tourette syndrome, ASD, autism. Now, all of these are injuries that if you are my age, you never heard of them when you were a kid. So we never saw these. I never knew anybody with any of those diseases, with the, with the exception of maybe ADHD. But all of these diseases, when, when Congress told the EPA, what year did the autism epidemic start? Autism has gone from one in 10,000 in my generation, and to this day, it's one in 10,000 in my generation. I've never met a man my age, 67 years old with full-blown autism, you know, non-verbal, non-toilet trained, uh, stimming, head banging, uh, toe walking, you, you just don't see them. And they're not locked up anywhere because there are no places for people like that. In my kids' generation, so it's one in 10,000 according to CDC data. It's one in 22 in my children's generation. And when Congress said to EPA, tell us what year that, that epidemic began, EPA came back and said that it was uh, 1989, that there's a red line. So, you know, see, so it, it, it's those diseases, it's also the allergic diseases, which also went epidemic in 89. Diseases like food allergies, peanut allergies, uh, eczema, anaphylaxis, and asthma, and then the autoimmune diseases suddenly became ubiquitous, stuff we never heard of as a kid, juvenile diabetes, um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Graves' disease, Crohn's disease, uh, Guillain-Barre, all of these autoimmune injuries, and, and um, you know, and all of those incidentally, are listed as vaccine side effects on the manufacturer's inserts of the 72 vaccines that are not doses that are not required for our children. So, and that's the one place where the pharmaceutical companies tell the truth because under the Vaccine Act, you cannot sue a vaccine company for injuring you, no matter how negligent they were, no matter how reckless they were, no matter how grievous your injury, you cannot sue them. The only exception to that is if they knew of an injury that is caused by their vaccine and they failed to list it on their manufacturer's insert. Mm -hmm. And so there are 420 injuries listed on the manufacturer's insert. And by the way, they're not allowed to list them unless the FDA believes that that injury was caused by the vaccine or that there is, a, there is significant scientific evidence that supports the association. 
So um, all of these, you know, the, we now have this chronic disease epidemic in our country. There's about 175 diseases of chronic diseases that are now epidemic. And every single one of them is listed as a side effect on those 72 vaccines, on at least one of those 72 vaccines doses. Okay. So in your view, which of the vaccines that are now given to children are, are necessary uh, given the severity of the, of the disease it's preventing versus the potential side effects? Well, you tell me what disease do you consider a threat? Because I, you know, I would say there's diseases that aren't aren't even casually contagious. That most of the vaccines after 1989 were added not for public health reasons, but for profit, pharmaceutical profit reasons. So why are we vaccinating one day old babies for hepatitis B when the only way they're going to get hepatitis B? is, you know, hepatitis B is sexually transmitted. You get it from having sex with, you know, with uh, from multiple partners and gay sex or from sex workers or intravenous drug use. Why would you give that to a baby? It, it, it clearly the only reason, in fact, Merck, when it developed the drug, was told by FDA and CDC, we want you to develop this for those vulnerable populations. And the, the populations, when they didn't buy it, Merck went back to the agencies and saying, you told us to develop this vaccine, nobody's buying it. And CDC said, don't worry, we'll just recommend it for children, we'll force everybody to buy it. So that's how it got on the schedule. There is no medical justification. It is true that you can get hepatitis B from an infected mother, but every mother in every hospital in the United States is tested for hepatitis B. So you can identify the kids who would benefit. You don't give it mass population wide. I'd say um, that the, uh, uh, you know, the meningitis vaccine by its own manufacturer's insert, the injury rate, the, the risk for death. If you vaccinate every college kid in this country with meningitis vaccine, by their own reckoning, you will kill more people from vaccine injuries than are killed by the disease annually. I think there's maybe 12 or 15 people who die annually from hepatitis B. I mean, from meningitis, um, the rotavirus vaccine is almost certainly killing more kids and injuring really grievous injuries to children than uh, rotavirus. So, you know, and, and you know, the, the chicken pox, why are we giving chicken pox? It's causing a shingles epidemic. Sh shingles is 20 times as deadly as chicken pox. Oh, and we knew that. And if you go to you're, you know, the, in most European countries, the chicken pox vaccine is prohibited. In Europe, if you go on in your, in the UK, if you go on the National Health Service website and look up chicken pox, they say we're not going to give it in the UK because it causes shingles epidemics. And that, what? of course, it's much more dangerous to get shingles than it is chicken pox. Chicken pox, you know, is a harmless rash. It's subtherapeutic in virtually everybody but if, if they don't i mean but if you don't but if you don't if you don't get chicken chicken pox when you're a kid and you don't get that lifetime immunity you're much more likely to get shingles when it gets older and there's you know there's lots of scientific data cdc's own studies and i'll give you the name of the author gary goldman predicted that if you go forward with this vaccine, you will have a shingles epidemic and it will be more deadly than chicken pox. And that's exactly what happened here. And that's exactly why the British don't do it. Is that because you have, you get the vaccine and then the immunity wears off potentially? Well, here's what happens in a natural population. Kids would get chicken pox, usually that came in two year cycles. So kids would get chicken pox and they'd have lifetime immunity. But the lifetime immunity was dependent on the kids, get, on uh, the adults getting periodically exposed to chicken pox. Your exposure to children who had chicken pox acted like a booster where it reactivated your own immunity. Mm -hmm. 
it were small numbers of people who got shingles at that time, but generally speaking, they were people who did not have contact with children. When I was a kid, shingles were associated with a kind of grouchy old curmudgeons of, you know, older people who hated kids. And we didn't know, nobody knew, we didn't know why. But those were the people who ended up getting shingles. And of course, it made them more pissed off when they got shingles. <laughs> um, because very, very painful. And it also can kill you and it could cause blindness. It's a really dangerous disease. If you get that vaccine, the immunity wears off and you know, seven to 10 years is gone. And for many, from I think a third or 50% of the population, those people are now vulnerable to adult chicken pox, which is very dangerous, or shingles, which is essentially is the same as Oster virus. And, you know, I mean, of course, the, the, the vaccine companies love it because what Merck did is it's giving people chicken pox shots, which makes a high level of the population then vulnerable to shingles. And in order to make the shingles vaccine, it just puts a double dose of the chicken pox in, in one vial and gives you that and say, now you had a chicken a shingles vaccine and it's cranking in money by giving us the shingles and by then saving us from shingles. So it's a scam. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised. These pharmaceutical companies are criminal enterprises. The four companies that make all of our vaccines have paid $72 billion in criminal penalties since 2000 or civil damages are falsifying science, for lying to regulators, for bribing, blackmailing doctors. They, these are the companies that created the opioid crisis. That they, you know, Merck gave us Vioxx, which killed 100,000 Americans at least. Um, and, you know, and they did it knowing it was going to cause heart attacks and they didn't tell the public. So these companies are not companies we should trust. And the only reason they got caught in all those cases because the individual plaintiff's attorneys like myself, representing individual clients who were injured, recovered documents on discovery that showed criminal conduct and then walked them down to the U.S. attorney's office and said, you should prosecute these people because they're criminals. The only place that could never happen is vaccines because you can't sue them. So there's no discovery, there's no depositions, there's no class actions or multi-district litigation. They can get away with anything they want forever. That's why it's so dangerous. That's why we need public scrutiny on this industry because they are, they are a rogue outlaw industry that is making, and, and you know, listen, if they, if, if they give you a measles vaccine, if I listen, I had measles when I was a kid. I had eleven brothers and sisters. We all got measles. It was, it was a great week. We stayed home. We watched Sea Hunt. You know, we got soup. What is the cure for measles? The treatment for measles is chicken soup and vitamin A. You can't patent those. So pharma was and it, seeing all these people who were sick and making no money. But if they give you a measles, an MMR vaccine. And now one in every couple thousand people get the seizures and one in every thousand of them now has lifetime epilepsy. You now have a, um, a customer for life who's paying a lot of money for chronic disease. Every one of these childhood diseases, mumps, measles, chicken pox, were self-limiting. In other words, after a week, they're gone. And they were all treatable. None of the chronic diseases that are caused by vaccines are self-limiting. They're lifetime injuries. They're untre they're they're treatable. The symptoms are treatable, but you're addicted. You now you have an, a, a seven. You know, like I'm buying for my kids, six hundred dollar epipens for life, and albuterol inhalers, and you know Adderall, and all of these things that are, that we now are are this generation is addicted to because they've all got chronic disease. I'm not saying the vaccines are causing all those chronic diseases because you know our kids today are swimming around in a toxic soup that we've created for them. And I don't just sue vaccine companies. I sue Monsanto and fluoride companies and EMFs 
PFOAs. I'm suing Monsanto for PFOAs too, which is another you know, suspect in the chronic disease epidemic. Neonicotinoid pesticides. There's a whole lot of culprits out there that share the same timeline. You got to find some environmental exposure that began in 1989 that affected every demographic. And suddenly Cuban kids in Key Biscayne, Miami have chronic disease and autism and ADD and food allergies. And at the same time, Inuit in, in Alaska do. So it's easy to figure out which one, there's only a certain amount of culprits. We know it has to be an environmental toxin because genes do not cause epidemics. They may provide the vulnerability, but you need an environmental toxin. So you need to identify toxins that became ubiquitous in 1989. I heard that your, um, I believe it was Instagram was shut down. So why do you think that you are being targeted to, I guess, stop what you're saying? And who do you think is doing that? You know, Instagram said that it was, I was passing vaccine misinformation, but they were not able to identify a single post I made that was ever factually erroneous. And we have a huge fact-checking operation at the Children's Health Defense. We have on our advisory board, a Nobel Prize winner, Luc Montagnier, who, who discovered the HIV virus. We have the former head of the National Toxicity Program. We have uh, 312 PhD scientists and physicians. We are, our fact-checking operation is run by Lynn Redwood, who is an who was an eight-year advisor to the Pentagon, to HHS. He was a public health official in Georgia. We do not put misinformation onto the public airwaves or, or internet. And Instagram had to deny me the right that it provided Donald Trump, who got to appeal. They had to stop me from appealing because they had no justification for evicting me from Instagram. The term vaccine misinformation as they use it is just a euphemism for any statement that challenges official orthodoxies or pharmaceutical or questions pharmaceutical products. If you've questioned pharmaceutical products, you get shut down and censored. Do you think that's because of the general public, I would say, believes that these products are safe, so it's going against the norm? Or do you think that pharmaceutical companies are involved in this somehow? Of course, the pharma is involved. And there's a, you know, there are, look at who's profiting from this. It's a, it's a coalition of pharmaceutical companies, of the internet titans who are making billions and billions from these government policies, from the lockdowns, who've had to, you know, engineered a, a transfer of wealth of $3.8 trillion from the middle classes globally to a handful of super rich, mainly internet titans like Bill Gates, like Larry Ellison, like Sergey Brin, Google, Oracle, Facebook, um, you know, the and, and Amazon. You shut down a million businesses. Who's going to profit from that? You lock people in the home for the year. Who's going to profit? Oh, you know, you look, you ask the question, qui bono, who is profiting? And that's how you can figure out who is, you know, and they've been very open about it. The same companies that are profiting from the lockdown are censoring critics of the lockdown. And, you know, that I think should, should uh, inform people as to what's happening in this country today. Do you think we've seen a, a coup d'etat against democracy over the past 20 months. We've seen our constitution obliterated, uh, freedom of speech, uh, uh, shutting down every church for a year and keeping the liquor stores open as essential businesses, which I have no problems with, but the churches are in the constitution, not the liquor stores. And I'm not saying you can't shut down a church if there's a medical crisis, but you need to do it democratically. You need to have public hearings. You can do emergencies, but you know, after a week or two, 
you need to have a public hearing and you need to have to, you need to show the science that you're relying on it. You need people to, to give the people the opportunity to debate that science and to challenge it and to bring their own science. And we need a public discussion. That's what democracy is. And that's been obliterated. They got rid of jury trials, you know, which are guaranteed in the sixth and seventh amendment that no American citizen shall be denied the right of a trial before a jury of his peers in, in cases or controversies exceeding $25 in value is very simple. There's no pandemic exception. There's no other exception. And yet jury trials have been abolished for any corporation that claims to be providing a countermeasure like a vaccine. You don't get to sue them. They do anything they want to you, destroy your life, your livelihood, tell you, you, unless you use this product, you can't work, you can't send your kids to school, you can't go on public transportation, and there's no public hearing. We don't, we don't get to challenge it. How, you know, this is a, a complete obliteration of, uh, of constitutional governance. Do you think it's possible that these pharmaceutical companies set out to do something like eradicate disease and that the side effects from vaccines were an accident and these people aren't actually aware of some of these dangers? Well, Pfizer is aware of the dangers because Pfizer, it's right in the data. You know, here's what Pfizer's data says. Pfizer, Pfizer was supposed to do a three month, a three year clinical trial. And it was actually a good thing because it was the first time that a vaccine company has ever been forced to do a pre-licensing clinical trial. And it was a big one. It was 22,000 in the placebo group, 22,000 in the vaccine group. So they shut it down at six months because they saw the vaccine was waning. The vaccines after six months, you know, we're seeing now data all over the world that they no longer give protection. So they had to shut it down at six months rather than do the full three years. At six months, they took the data to that date, they showed it to FDA and they got the license. Why did they get the license? They got the license because they were able to show there was one of those 22,000 people, there was one death, one death in the vaccine group. And there were two deaths in the placebo group. So they were able to make the claim, the vaccine is 100% effective because the number two is 100% of the number one. Most Americans, when they hear it's 100% effective against death, assume they're, they're thinking absolute risk. And if you get the vaccine, you have 100% chance of not dying, but that's not what it said. What it said is you need to give 22,000 vaccines to save one life from COVID. Here's the really bad news. In the vaccine group, according to Pfizer's data, 20 people died. In the placebo group, in that six month period of those 22,000, 20 people died. In the placebo group, 14 died. So what that indicates is that your chances of dying if you're vaccinated are 48% greater than if you're unvaccinated. How are they dying? Well, here's what their Pfizer's data say. In the vaccine group, five people died from heart attacks. In the placebo group, one person died of a heart attack. So if you get the vaccine, you're 500% greater chance of dying of a heart attack. And for every one life they save from COVID, they're killing four people from heart attacks. Pfizer knows this. It's their data. The table is called S4. Anybody who's watching this can look it up. And so you can't say that Pfizer doesn't know that it is causing public health havoc right now with this product. And, you know, we're seeing these explosions on VAERS, the biggest, you know, we're, we're, this vaccine has had more deaths reported in the last year than during 30, what, five years of the existence of the system all put together from billions and billions and billions of vaccines. We're seeing these death rates that are off the charts. And um, and we also know that only that few, probably fewer than one percent of those deaths are actually being reported. Most people who have a parent who dies a month or a few weeks after vaccination is not reporting it to theirs. 
very few do, according to HHS's own study, fewer than 1% of vaccine deaths are reported. Yeah. Okay. So what are your views on, on um, giving this COVID vaccine that they've made to kids? I know I'm from Canada and I, I think that they're implementing that in order to go to school in Canada. Well, they have to give it to kids because here's why. The, they cannot market this vaccine without having immunity shield. Oh, I mean, I sue pharmaceutical companies for a living and I have enough criminal activity that I know about Pfizer at this point and Moderna. That if they went ahead and marketed a vaccine where I where they can where they end up killing people or injuring them, and I can sue them, well, they'd be through. So they're never going to market a vaccine, allow people access to a vaccine, an approved vaccine, without getting liability protected. And now the the emergency use authorization vaccines have liability protection under the PREP Act and the CARES Act. So as long as you take an emergency use, you can't sue them. Once they get approved, now you can sue them unless they can get it recommended for children. What? Because, Because all vaccines that are recommended, officially recommended for children get liability protection, even if an adult gets that vaccine. That's why they're going after kids. They know this is going to kill and injure a huge number of children, but they need to do it for the liability protection. And here's how they know that it's going to injure kids. During the Pfizer study, they only tested it on 1,300 children. And one of those we now know was a girl called Maddie Gary. And we only know about this because she and her family came forward and told them what told us what happened. Maddie Gary got the vaccine. She immediately went into seizures. She is now in a wheelchair for life and she needs a feeding tube to eat. So Pfizer, you know, because Pfizer only tested on 1300 kids, it is stuck with the, with the extrapolation And one out of every 1,300 kids is going to be injured like that, an injury worse than death. Pfizer did not report her injury. Instead, it said she had a stomach ache. So that's what they reported to the FDA. They lied. And they know that that this, here's what the Lancet study showed. The Lancet study showed that Lancet could not, the researchers could not find a single child in the world who died, a healthy child who died from COVID. There are many children who died, but, you know, not a lot. I think the UK had only like 25 um, confirmed, PCR confirmed COVID deaths in children. We, in this country, we had under 400. But all of those children had severe comorbidities. Most of them were um, really extremely obese and had diabetes, asthma, and a lot of other comorbidities. Healthy kids do not die from COVID. So why would you give them an intervention that we know can kill them? That is causing myocarditis and death in children all over the world right now. We know that. Why would you ever give a child that intervention? You're not doing it for the child. There's no pretense it's going to help that child. And what they'll say is, well, we're giving it to him so he doesn't get granny sick, but there's no evidence. And children, children tend to internalize this disease. They're not coughing and, you know, and sneezing with it. It, t- it tends to, they tend to internalize it. There's no evidence that they're passing it to anybody. And anyway, there's a big ethical problem of saving it, of killing a kid or or putting a child at risk to save a very old person. There is an ethical dilemma there that people need to be talking about. But if there's no argument that you're giving this to the child for his own health. You're giving it to the child. I mean, the real reason that, you know, to me is obvious. I can't read minds, but, you know, having written this book and having studied the pharmaceutical industry for 18 years, 
Um, it's pretty evident that the re their rationale for giving it to kids is they need the liability protection. And you can only get that if you mandate it for children. If, you know, Pfizer did get an authorization, a license to sell its vaccine in the United States. But what it did is a trick. It it created a new vaccine out of the same vaccine. So the same vial, it put a different label on it and called it the Cominati. And the one that got approved is the one with the Cominati label, although it's identical to the BioNTech vaccine that we're all taking, which is emergency use authorization. The Cominati, they will not make it available to Americans. Why? Because you can sue them. And so it's the only one approved and they will not sell it here because we can sue them. What they're waiting for is this approved for children. And as soon as it gets mandated for children, now they have liability protection and they'll give it to the rest of us and we won't be able to sue them. And which vaccine is that? This is the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is not, the, there's an approved version and there is an, uh, there is an emergency use version it, and they're identical. I see. Okay. Uh, the one of them has a different label, and that one with that label is the only one that is approved, but you cannot get it in our country because they're not going to allow an American to get it because if you get it, you can sue them. Can you get it in other countries? I think you can get it in Europe, but they have other liability protection over there, which I'm not familiar with. So um, you mentioned that the vaccines you thought were the most dangerous were ones with aluminum in them. One, why is there aluminum in there in the first place? And two, what kind of danger would that pose to people? Well, here's, you know, the, the, in the history of vaccinology, vaccines originally were all live virus vaccines. So the polio vaccine was live virus and, you know, the smallpox was live virus. But what they found is that if you give somebody, they, a live virus vaccine is a, a mutation of the virus that is less deadly. So you give the people, you make them a little bit sick and they get the lifetime immunity. That was the theory. The problem is the viruses were oftentimes mutating inside of the person and then the, you know, through their urine or their feet, their, mainly their feces, the, uh, the mutated version would, would develop more pathogenicity, more virulence and would spread. So today, 70% of the polio cases in the world are vaccine strain. They're coming from vaccinated individuals. Vaccinated individuals can shed the virus and infect other people. So the regulatory agencies early on uh, expressed a preference for dead virus vaccines. The problem is that dead virus vaccines do not provoke the same robust, durable antibody response. And a vaccinologist, in order to get a license, you need to show that the vaccine lasts a certain amount of time and that it is, you know, that it has a powerful antibody response. So vaccinologists discovered early on that if they, if they add an ingredient to the vaccine that is horrendously toxic, that the body associates that toxic material with the viral antigen. And the next time it sees that antigen, it will mount a robust immune response. And there is a saying, a mantra in vaccinology that the more toxic the adjuvant, the more robust the response. So there was a search among vaccinologists and virologists around the globe um, for the most toxic elements in the universe to add to vaccines and to provoke these responses. And, you know, they, they want uh, aluminum. I mean, mercury was a, a very, very um, ubiquitous addition. They put it in, they say it as a preservative, but it didn't act as a preservative. It was really there as an adjuvant and NIH admitted that to us. The mercury is the most toxic element in the universe known to man that is not radioactive. So it's a thousand more times more neurotoxic than lead. Why would you, would you ever dream of injecting your child with lead? Well, you're injecting them with something that is a thousand times worse than lead. And mercury was removed from most American vaccines, except for the flu vaccine in 2003. And they needed to replace another 
you know, the, the mercury was not something else that was horribly toxic, so they use aluminum. The problem is with vaccinologists is they don't look at chronic disease and they don't they they don't know anything about toxicology. Oh, uh, you know, and they don't like toxicologists because the toxicologists would come in and say, "Yeah, it that that aluminum is making the vaccine last longer." The the, the you know the antibody effect of the vaccine last longer, but what's happening to the aluminum in your body? You know, what is the fate of it? Is it being excreted or is it going to your organs and particularly to your brain? And as it turns out, that's exactly what it's doing. It's going to your brain and it's staying in your brain for decades and causing inflammation. And we know this because there is a series of studies that NIH did during the eighties and one of them particularly by Thomas Burbacker, but there's many, many other studies that are that show that the aluminum, I mean, there are studies by Chris Shaw, Chris Exley, who are kind of the world's experts on aluminum toxicity, that looking at the brains of children who have uh, autism and other neurological diseases and finding that they're loaded with mercury, with, with aluminum, and that the aluminum is, um, you know, at levels you see in an adult with Alzheimer's and the cadavers of an adult with Alzheimer's. Shaw looked at, I think, 10 kids' uh, uh, cadavers and, and found this. Here's something that people should know, is that aluminum provokes an allergic response, and that's why it's valuable. So if you put the aluminum in with the viral antigen, your body now mounts an allergic response to that viral antigen, whether it's polio or hepatitis B or the, you know, HPV or whatever. So, but what we now know, the science suggests, is that the alumina also creates allergic responses to anything that's in the ambient environment. So if you have a peanut oil excipient in that vaccine you, and you put aluminum in it, how you could have a lifetime allergy to peanuts. If you, if there's a Timothy weed outbreak, the, the week that you get that aluminum vaccine, you now may have a lifetime allergy to, to Timothy weed. And that's why probably, you know, there's two studies by Moss and, and Cowlings, which show that children who are vaccinated with aluminum vaccines have 30 times the rate of allergic rhinitis as kids who don't. And, you know, all of these, um, these food allergy epidemics date to the time that we started giving these kids this aluminum. And uh, because my kids have these allergies, I'm one of the founders of the Food Allergy Initiative and the Food Allergy Network, which is the biggest food allergy research group. And what, you know, so that group has scientists from all over the world who are giving food allergies to rats and then figuring out how to treat them. How do they give the allergy to the rat? They take the aluminum from the adjuvant from the hepatitis B vaccine, add a latex molecule, and that rat now has a permanent latex allergy. You add a peanut molecule, and it now has a permanent peanut allergy. You add a dairy molecule, it now has a, a, a permanent dairy allergy. Oh, you wonder why all of this whole generation of children is allergic to stuff. It's because we've been inducing allergies by pumping them full of aluminum. That's great. That's crazy. Yeah. Thank, thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, I hope you won't edit out my best arguments. I won't edit anything. This entire thing is going up. Wow. I want to see what they do to you. Thank you very much, Miguel. <laughs> thank you very much for coming on. Bye. Okay, this is awesome. I'm doing investments for dad and this one is really cool. Investing in fine art. I recently learned that top earners allocate around 20% of their wealth into just one asset class. With inflation at a 39 year high and with no signs of stopping on top of COVID variants affecting the stock market, it's a pretty good time to rethink what you invest in. And one of the smartest ways to diversify your portfolio is by investing in fine art. This is a really cool idea I think most people can get behind. I hadn't heard of it before. Maybe you've never thought about it. 
but the 1% have been doing this for generations. The art market, which the Wall Street Journal's called one of the hottest on earth today, is projected to be worth 2.7 trillion by 2026, which means when the markets crash and stock prices go berserk, like they have been since the pandemic started, art prices continue to surge, and you no longer have to be an A-list celebrity to invest in million dollar works of art. Masterworks is the first and only fintech company that securitizes blue chip artwork from artists like Warhol, Banksy, so anyone can invest in multi-million dollar paintings at an affordable entry point. For example, the first painting Masterworks sold was Banksy's Mona Lisa for 1.5 million, and that went on to get investors a 32% net annualized return. Over 260,000 investors are already doing it. If you wanna check it out, visit masterworks.art slash MP today. Again, that's masterworks.art slash MP. See important disclaimers at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Amish Adalja, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. So I'm a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which is a public health think tank focused on emerging infectious diseases, biosecurity, bioterrorism, the intersection of infectious disease and national security, as well as pandemic preparedness. I'm also a practicing infectious disease, critical care and emergency medicine physician and taking care of patients uh, throughout this pandemic. And I do a lot of media and public speaking on these topics as well. Okay, great. So this format of episode, um, I had somebody on who has, who's skeptical of vaccines, you could say that, to say the least. So I'm having you on to, I like, and with your background to describe vaccines in the ways, well, you believe they should be described. So it should be a good conversation. I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. Uh, so let's go. Uh, the, just vaccines in general, vaccines that are given to children, do you believe any of them are dangerous in, in any way um, that people aren't aware of? Not really. So when you look at any vaccine, there's always a risk benefit calculation you have to make that there are risks of the vaccine, there are risks of the disease that you're preventing. But when you look at the vaccines that are used in routine childhood immunization in Western countries, they are very, very safe vaccines and the diseases that they're preventing really have risks that are higher than the risks from the vaccine. There's always changes and updates made based on different prevalences of infections and different vaccines that may be developed. But what you're getting as a child now is a, a, a group of very safe vaccines that have been proven to be effective and really uh, have a great benefit to the individual child being vaccinated. Okay. So something that came up with the last guy I spoke with was the hep B vaccine. He said, America has gives out more vaccinations to children than anywhere on earth. And that's, something a good, that's a good thing. I would say that's a good thing. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but one vaccine in particular, and I didn't know this, the hep B vaccine. So can you describe, can you explain why that would be given to somebody that's so young, like somebody who's one day old, as opposed to waiting a little bit longer? So hepatitis B is a, a major cause of liver cancer around the world. It causes acute liver inflammation. It, it, it can kill people. And we have really great hepatitis B vaccines. And initially, those were given to people that were high risk because maybe they were injection drug users or they got blood transfusions or they worked in the healthcare industry or they were commercial sex workers based on the way that hepatitis B transmits. And what we saw is that there were really still major gaps in uptake of the vaccine. And what studies showed was giving the vaccine early on at birth increases the, the rate of uptake. And what we've seen is this safe and effective vaccine given to newborns ended up translating to lower hepatitis B rates throughout lifetime and through in, in the country. So the reason why they give that vaccine isn't because the two day old is at risk for getting hepatitis B, although they could get it from a mother, their mother, it's because when you give the vaccine at that point, it ensures that they actually get vaccinated because we saw drop-offs. Even if you say, maybe don't get it at, before you leave the hospital, but get it at your first child, your, your child pediatrician's visit, your child's pediatrician visit, we saw a drop-off and that translated into more hepatitis B cases. So that's why the recommendation came to give this vaccine to babies before they leave the hospital because it ensured that they got the vaccine and we saw actual benefits in terms of hepatitis B risk and cases 
based on changing the policy to recommend it before people leave the hospital. So then why not give some of these other vaccines earlier? Because vaccines are not given arbitrarily. They have to be given at certain times based on the immune system, based on uh, other things that are going on. And for many vaccines, if you give them too early, and this isn't the case with hepatitis B, the maternal antibodies that that the child is exposed to through the placenta will interfere with the vaccine. So for example, if you give an influenza vaccine to a child below the age of six months, a lot of that vaccine won't really actually do anything because there's so much maternal influenza antibody that basically mop up the vaccine. Uh, The same is true for the the measles, mumps, rubella. So we tend to wait until the antibodies fall and that's when we give the, give the vaccines. But we, there, there's always a little bit of latitude when the best time to give the vaccines are, but it is based on the immune system of the developing child, as well as the epidemiology of the infection. Okay, and so then why not, is it safer to wait longer then? Because I've heard from people who are more skeptical of vaccines that the younger you give it, the harder it is neurologically, but to, in, like as opposed to waiting until children are say five or something like that. There's no evidence. To, there's no evidence to support that waiting longer changes anything with the safety profile. I think this is something that is misunderstood. Uh, you should get the vaccine when when it's the appropriate time to get the vaccine, and they have been proven to be safe and effective at the time that you're giving them. And there's no evidence that delaying the vaccine somehow increases the safety when the vaccine is is needed at a certain period of time or has been studied in that certain time period. I think it's sort of arbitrary to say, maybe if we give it later, it might work better, but it could be the other way around. It could also work less well when you give it later, or it could not work and have more side effects when when it works later. I think that people don't really understand that these aren't just kind of people throwing a dart at, at at a timeline and saying, this is when we're going to give you the vaccine. They actually think about when the optimal time to give it is. Okay. Is it true that there are no in order to get a vaccine tested, they don't do double blind studies, or is that not true? That's not true. Um, For example, the COVID-19 vaccines, these were uh, double blind placebo controlled studies where people didn't know if they were getting an innocuous substance injected into them or uh, the the COVID-19 vaccine. So double blind uh, controlled trials are the gold standard for, for vaccine trials and for trials of any other type of medication. Is that just for the vaccine for COVID or is that for other vaccines as well? Other vaccines are, are, are studied in double blind. Tri- There's multiple different trial designs. The, the gold standard is double blind placebo controlled trials. Sometimes we do head to head trials with two different types of vaccines if there are two competitors out there or, or an improved vaccine. But the double blind uh, controlled trial is what's used for the initial approval of virtually all vaccines, to my knowledge. Okay. Here's another concern that's frequently brought up aluminum in vaccines as the adjuvant. Is there evidence that that either accumulates in tissues or that that's toxic in other ways or that it links people to allergens in the environment while you're provoking an immune response to whatever disease you're being vaccinated against? There's no evidence that aluminum as an adjuvant is harmful. Actually, aluminum as an adjuvant is helpful. We put aluminum in vaccines so they actually stimulate your immune system in in a more strong fashion to give you more protection. I actually wish our vaccines had more adjuvants in them, but sometimes people don't like the the feeling after an adjuvant because it does make your arm a little bit sore if you get an adjuvant in vaccine. But no, there's no evidence that the currently used adjuvants have any major problem, especially not uh, aluminum, which is one of the more widely used uh, used, uh, um, adjuvants. But in general, you have to remember that it's not like people are giving adjuvants in order to try and harm somebody with them. The the adjuvant is there because they're trying to make the vaccine more effective. Uh, Adjuvants are are an important tool that we use. Is it possible, though, that by adding an adjuvant, people exposed to other allergens while they're being vaccinated could end up with allergies to whatever that other allergen is, like the uprise in peanuts or or egg whites? I had this, this and this could be completely off. And I'm totally aware of that. But I know that there were, I I believe it was egg whites added to vaccines to trigger an immune response. And I know there was an uptick in egg allergens, allergies, an uptick in peanut allergies, soy allergies. I'm wondering if that has any link between the increase in vaccination for children. I don't think there's any strong evidence to support that. And it's important to remember, like when you look at aluminum, remember you get tons of aluminum in your normal diet. It's the amount that's in a vaccine is, is much less than what you're ingesting or getting exposed to in the environment. There, there have been reactions to certain adjuvants in, in the past that, that have precluded their use or have questions. For example, during the pandemic of H1N1 in 2009, there were some adjuvanted vaccines 
that have somewhat been linked to narcolepsy. That hasn't been fully um, proven, but it was a, a signal. And I think people are, are cautious about those adjuvants in certain situations. But in general, uh, remember that you're we're talking about risk benefit ratios and what, and what you're trying to protect against. And I think that all in all, adjuvants and vaccines are an improvement on, on vaccines. And there isn't any clear indication that they, that they provoke or cause allergies. Although there have been reactions to adjuvants, like I mentioned with narcolepsy and certain, and certain pandemic H1N1 vaccines and certain adjuvants definitely make your arm hurt, you get more reactogenic, but that's sort of part of the adjuvant working. But, but in general, I think that the more adjuvants we had in vaccines, the more effective our vaccines would be. The less we would need boosters, the less we would uh, have to worry about breakthrough infections with whatever it might be. Uh, just out of curiosity, what was the adjuvant that's potentially linked to narcolepsy? Although you said that wasn't proven, just out of curiosity. The, the adjuvant that was suspected to be involved with narcolepsy is something called ASO3, uh, which is kind of an oil and oil and water emulsion adjuvant is what it's described as. That's the one where there was uh, some uh, some hint that narcolepsy might have been more common in people who received vaccines containing that adjuvant. But that was something that our safety systems detected and quickly have been trying to run down and understand. Uh, understand It wasn't something that was uh, not well known. This was something that was clear uh, when, um, when that, that signal was identified. And did they identify that before the vaccine went out? No, this was something that they had seen anecdotally reported after the vaccine was, was um, used. It wasn't used in every country. So for example, in the United States, that, that type of vaccine wasn't used but it was used in places like Canada. Um, and it was picked up with the safety signal saying that there, there had been some, some cases of narcolepsy. And this is still something that isn't completely understood mm -hmm. why this happened or, or, or what type of signal it was. And, and I think it, it's still an area of active investigation of, of narcole narcolepsy is linked to some of these pandemic vaccines because there hadn't been vaccines that had caused in the past or this that measurements were quite clear. What happened with, with that management and in that side effect. And I think it's still something that is a, is a, co a correlation signal, but not something that I would say has been definitively unraveled. Okay. That makes sense. Um, in regards to the COVID vaccine specifically, I was told, and I haven't done any background research on this, so I'm not sure what's right here, but I'm, I was told that in the Pfizer vaccine trial group, 20 people died versus the placebo group where 14 people died. Have you heard anything about this? I don't think that that's uh, accurate representation. Uh, when we look at what happened in that, first of all, when you look at that, you have to understand what the cause of death, what the cause of deaths were. Are they related to the treatment, first of all? And I think that those raw numbers are wrong. I think when you look at the, the, Pfizer, the, the Pfizer data, and I don't have it memorized to be able to quote it off the top of my head. I, I've seen no such signal like that. And when you look at where the COVID-19 cases occurred, it was almost exclusively in the placebo group, and there wasn't really any imbalance in deaths that that uh, is concerning. I think that the Pfizer vaccine, even beyond the clinical trial, has really pro proven its ability to to save lives, and, and I don't think that that's an accurate representation of uh, of where the of what deaths occurred. But remember, even just looking at raw numbers of deaths in a trial, you have to understand that people are still, especially when you're vaccinating higher higher risk people or you're vaccinating people that might have other conditions, that there may be other diseases that that may cause them to succumb, which might cause deaths in the in a treatment group in any clinical trial that are unrelated to the treatment. But I don't think that those numbers seem to be accurate to me, but I don't have those that 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 trial data right in front of me to be able to um, uh, to actually address it specifically. Uh, the concern I've heard was that, okay, so, and I think you, you, people read about this in the news is that the vaccine can potentially cause some sort of heart problem. And so in the Pfizer study, more people died of heart attacks in the vaccine group than they did in the placebo group. So then you have people saying, okay, it can increase your risk of a heart attack. So it's not death by COVID, but it's still an associated death. So the, the heart conditions that people are talking about with COVID-19 vaccines are not heart attacks. It's something called myocarditis, which is different. It's heart inflammation. And when you look at those myocarditis cases, they tend to be very mild and not uh, leading to death. Whereas when you look at COVID-19 and it's linked to heart attacks, uh, we see that there is kind of a synergy between COVID-19 and, 
in coronary artery disease and in heart in heart attacks that, that have occurred. So I don't think that, that the myocarditis or these side effects that people are talking about, and there is a signal for myocarditis with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, primarily in, in boys that are in their late teen years to early adulthood, uh, that's not uh, a heart attack. And that's not really something that, um, to, to me, changes the risk benefit ratio of the vaccine because those myocarditis cases tend to be mild. They tend to be something that's reversible. And, and the, the rate of myocarditis that occurs from the vaccine is much lower than the rate of myocarditis that occurs post-COVID. Mm, that's a good point, post-COVID. Um, do you think it's worth mandating that people below the age of 18 need to get these COVID vaccines? So when you use the word mandate, it's important to kind of unpack it. it, it mandate can mean many things. You know, is it something that schools want to require as a condition of, of, of enrollment? Is it something that a sports team or a sports league wants to have for, for kids to participate in that sport? Or is it something that government is actually saying this needs to be done as a condition of life? And I think that it's important to, because people lump all of those together, because to me, a mandate would be something a, a true mandate would be something that the government actually says. And, and no, I don't think that the government should mandate the vaccine for people that are under the ages of 18. I think if schools want to do that as a condition of enrollment, that's perfectly fine. And I would say that that's, that's a reasonable decision to make. If organizations want to do that, uh, for example, for kids to participate in something, I think that's something that's, that can be done. But I don't think it should be the government uh, making that decision um, to, to make the mandate. I think this is something that private private organizations can do. It's a little bit muddled because governments control private private institutions, like what would be private institutions in, in some situations like schools. Um, but I think in, in general, no, I don't think it, it should be a government mandate that children under the age, uh, children be, be, uh, be vaccinated. I th and I think in general, government mandates for vaccination are probably not are not the way to do this. I think private organizations are, are, are much better suited to do this. And, and it's a much cleaner way of, of actually getting vaccine vaccine uptake higher is to have private businesses do it because it's in their interest to do so rather than it being something that the government requires of people. Is it true that if you do end up, if you do end up vaccine injured, which can be rare, but if that does happen, that there's nothing you can really do about it in regards to suing vaccine companies? It, it, this differs depending upon the country that you're in, but in the United States, they have a separate system, uh, which is called the these. There was this. They're called vaccine courts, or vac there's a vaccine injury compensation fund. So when you get a vaccine or you buy a vaccine, there's a tax on it, and that is put towards this fund. So when you do have a vaccine injury, you can bring that claim to the vaccine court, and they adjudicate that to see whether or not there is a plausible link between the vaccine and whatever injury, and then there is a payout from that vaccine injury compensation fund that exists. So this was something that was set up during the Reagan administration as a way to encourage companies to get involved in vaccines because vaccines are controversial. They've been controversial since they were first invented in the late 1700s. And many pharmaceutical companies said they didn't even want to get involved in vaccines or they were pulling out because it was such a litigious area. And that would be really bad for all of us if companies didn't want to make vaccines. We've had shortages of flu vaccines and tetanus vaccines. And, and I think that's not the situation we want to have where, where companies are not wanting to do it. So what was offered as a solution was an alternative court system with this injury compensation fund where, where bring those injury claims to that court. So it's not as if you have no recourse if you do get injured by a vaccine. There is a whole separate process put in place because uh, for that exact reason. So I think that this is sort of a, a, mis a mistaken idea that it's not as if you're just ha have not nothing to do if you've, if you've been actually legitimately injured by a vaccine. There is a whole system in place to be able to handle those claims. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. But then you can't do it the regular way where you can sue a company. No, it's it's something separate. When, when depending upon the vaccine, depending upon the, there's certain criteria for which which claims are are used in that court. But but that's that's basically an alternative system, an alternative court system, an alternative legal framework that's used for vaccines in the United States, rather than than bringing lawsuits directly in in normal court. This is a whole separate system that we have in order to to kind of, kind of streamline it, to have expert ac expert access, and to have this fund where people can have can get payouts based on on whatever injury it is. So it's 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 a parallel system 
that I think has worked, um, although I think it's, mis- it's, it's widely misunderstood. Yeah, that's interesting. So it was potentially set up by the Reagan administration to encourage pharmaceutical companies to invest and make vaccines without necessarily feeling like they would be sued repeatedly, that it was too dangerous of a, of, I guess, a mission to go on. Right. So if, you, if, you're a, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're looking at what do I want to invest in, what do I want to make? I mean, vaccines are never at the top of the list. In general, infectious disease products are never at the top of the list. And with vaccines, because of the rise of, of anti-vaccine sentiment, because of, because of the, the way vaccines have kind of been engulfed into kind of cultural wars, you, you find that many companies, that's the last thing that they want to get involved in because they're so controversial. And, and what we were seeing were many vaccine manufacturers, traditional vaccine manufacturers, kind of pulling out saying, this isn't something we're going to really invest in. And that would, and that alarmed a lot of people, because if we don't have people that are adept at making vaccines, we're really going to be at a higher threat for many infectious diseases. This was one way to make it, make it um, much more feasible for these companies to be able to produce their products in, in a manner where they weren't really worried about the, the downside loss for, or all of the, the lawsuits kind of piling up that they'd have to, to deal with on a one-by-one basis. And that's why this whole alternative system was, was set up in the 1980s. Hmm. That's interesting. You can see how people can get conspiratorial when things like that happen, where they're like, oh, you know, they can't be sued. Like they're immune. So they can go out there and potentially harm you and nobody can do anything about it because they have a separate, you know, court. You can, you I can look at that court. Are confused. You can look at that court and see how much money they paid out and what they've actually determined was a vaccine injury versus what wasn't. And I think it has worked. It has worked well because the interesting thing is on the other side of this, the anti-vaccine people will often cite the payouts as a way to show that vaccines aren't safe, saying, you know, the vaccine injury court has paid out this much money. That means that these vaccines are not, not safe, where on the one hand, they say that. And on the other hand, they say, well, you can't, you have no recourse if you have a vaccine injury. So it, it, they can't really have it both ways. And I think uh, it, it's important just to put that on the record that this, this whole system exists um, in order to deal with the, the rare vaccine injuries that occur. Yeah. Okay. Why do you think, and what have you seen with your public talks? Why do you think there's so much anti-vaccine sentiment? Well, there's always been anti-vaccine sentiment. I think what's happened is we've got a particularly virulent form of it lately. So when Edward Jenner invented the first vaccine, the vaccine against smallpox, that's when the anti-vaccine movement was born. If you look at the cartoons from the newspapers at that time, uh, they were mocking him and and saying that people were going to turn into cows if they took this vaccine. And and the same thing has kind of been true with every new vaccine, that, that, that there's been opposition. But what I would say has accelerated is that with the allegations in the 1990s, um, regarding the scene, which were disproved and, and, and shown to be completely fallacious uh, regarding autism, the anti-vaccine movement took on a, a kind of a new strength. And they've been emboldened by celebrity culture, where you've got multiple celebrities that sometimes will voice this. And, and I think that people also have, I think that maybe some people have kind of turned against science and scientific knowledge. Because when you look, for example, at the way people are against GMOs, for example, where there's really no strong evidence that GMOs or genetically modified organisms cause problems, that's that, that same kind of precautionary principle, why should we put something unnatural into our body, that I think has kind of spilled into people's thoughts about vaccines. And, and we live in, in 2021, in most of the of the Western world, in a, pl- in a place where we don't have to think about deaths from measles or deaths from diarrhea or pediatric pneumonia deaths. So you kind of have that luxury. So it's all out of sight, out of, out of mind. And I think that they don't realize what the vaccines have done, the, the lives they've saved, the infections that they didn't caught, that didn't happen. That's People are kind of blind to that because it's not something they think about anymore. And thankfully, they don't have to think about it because, because of the work that vaccines have done. So that makes you think, well, I heard so-and-so's kid had some problem after they got this vaccine and and there's not been a measles case in this county for so long why should i get this for example they might say so they 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 kind of get that anecdotal thinking about these vaccine injuries they hear about and then they don't see the other side of that the measles cases that don't happen or the kids with with chicken pox that get hospitalized or or people who with, with with polio so then they think well why should i need it it's not really an issue and and i think that's kind of that that kind of sloppy thinking has really become very very common and then you have the, the way that people have used 
vaccines as part of these culture wars to to cater to whatever collective tribe that they might be trying to um to uh engender themselves to or to ingratiate themselves to and i think they use to me i always say it's like the it's this voice of the dark ages against science that uses 21st century tools to broadcast their message and i think that's what's really scary now because the anti-vaccine movement has really grown in its influence they are very proactive and most of us in the medical community are very reactive and i think they have been winning because we haven't been able to really uh, articulate the case for vaccines in a in a forceful proactive way we're often just kind of responding to one conspiracy theory after another conspiracy theory and it's become a situation where people who are pro vaccine sometimes run scared i mean i've been admonished at hospitals i work at for being too pro vaccine where we the pro vaccine the pro vaccine physicians get nasty emails and, and death threats and threats of violence almost on a daily basis now. I mean, th this is, I think, a really bad sign because to me, vaccines and their benefit are incontrovertible. I tell people, you know, everybody clamors for a new iPhone. They all wait in line to get a new iPhone. That's how I think people should think about vaccines. But this is some great new piece of technology that's going to improve my life, allow me to live better. And you should want that. Um, they used to have ticker tape parades when I'm talking to you now from Pittsburgh, which is my hometown, and this is where the polio vaccine was uh, invented by Jonas Salk. When he came back after the announcement of the results to Pittsburgh, he had to have a police escort, and there were ticker tape parades and, and people putting up signs in the window saying, thank you, Dr. Salk. That's not how we greet new vaccines now. A new vaccine is not greeted the way Dr. Salk was greeted. A new vaccine is greeted with conspiracy theories. I think about the way the HPV, the Gardasil vaccine, which prevents cervical cancer, how that was greeted, not like the polio vaccine. And I think that really speaks to something that's wrong in, in our culture and, and, and some loss of respect for science that I think we're, we're all going to pay for. And we are paying for it with the low uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, for example, in the United States. I think people are confused for a number of reasons. I mean, even I'm confused, but I would say one, like the rate of disease in children has skyrocketed in the last like 30 years. And I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as a child. So I've spent my life and I have it in remission now, thank goodness. But uh, I've spent my time kind of thinking why, right? And so then if you're in, put in that position, you kind of look everywhere. Like I've gone, you know, way out there to try and figure out why this could happen. And I don't know if I'll ever figure it out, but I, I think you end up with a population of people who are saying, okay, well, we've been listening to pharmaceutical companies um, and everyone's sicker. Like, so yeah, we're not getting measles anymore, but the rate of autoimmune disorders are up or mental illness and neurological disorders are up. And so people start maybe incorrectly associating the, the two or associating that with anything newer it's interesting that they don't like one of this is actually an area where there's a lot of hypotheses about why allergies why autoimmune conditions have went up and one of the things that i think needs more uh study is the overuse of antibiotics oh, because yeah. while, while you say that vaccines have gone up the use of antibiotics for for all kinds of upper respiratory tract infections inappropriate antibiotic use correlates very strongly with allergy with asthma with autism with childhood obesity, so so there there may there is a signal there, but I don't think it's vaccines that are the problem. I think it's inappropriate use of antibiotics, and and think about how many antibiotic courses people get now mm -hmm. um, as a child as a child for maybe viral ear infections or viral coughs. That I think is something that really needs to be addressed, and I think that vaccines are getting blamed for something that that's probably not that's probably more related or likely to be related to overuse of antibiotics than than anything. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've looked into that. I was on antibiotics constantly as a kid that could have contributed to it. Uh, I think some of the skepticism comes from confusion about this specific COVID vaccine. So you hear about the polio vaccine and I'm not entirely, you could actually describe what that looked like when you got vaccinated. But from what I know, you got the vaccine, you had a bit of a reaction and then you never got polio. And that's not what we're seeing with COVID. And people are like, well, the vaccine doesn't work. It's not like the polio vaccine. It's not like these other vaccines. So it doesn't work. You have to keep getting it. This entire thing is a scam. Then you go down that route. And maybe you could address that a bit. When you think about vaccines, they're, they're tasked with doing different things based on the disease and what's going on. 
And not every vaccine produces what's called sterilizing immunity, meaning is like a force field around you so you don't get infected. And with these first generation COVID vaccines, our goal was not to prevent every infection, but to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And by that standard, they're performing off the charts. There may be second generation vaccines down the line that work more like the measles vaccine, but we don't have those yet. And I think it's important to judge these vaccines based on what they were actually designed to do. And, and by that standard, as I said, um, they're, they're some of the most successful vaccines we've seen. And you can just open your eyes if you walk through the hospital and see who's getting who's getting hospitalized, who's dying. And uh, I'll be taking care of patients with COVID tomorrow. And, and it's gonna be primarily unvaccinated people. Yes, breakthrough infections occur, but they're very rare. And when the, and the severe ones are even rarer. And that's actually evidence of the vaccine working, not that it's failing or that it's some kind of scam, because we, we, weren't, we weren't trying with these first generation vaccines to be able to, to create a, a bug zapper around you so that no virus got on you. Uh, the, the idea was to make this a tamer virus, one that's much more like other viruses. And think about the flu vaccine. Uh, flu vaccine breakthrough infections occur all the time. But we know, for example, look at pediatric deaths in flu. The vast majority of children who die from flu are not vaccinated. So the flu vaccine's goal is not to prevent every infection, but to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And many people accept that about the flu vaccine. Not every vaccine does the same thing. And not we don't have the same goal with every infectious disease. And it's important to remember that because COVID-19 is not something that can be eradicated or eliminated. We're going to have COVID cases 20 years from now. The goal is to make it much more manageable. And that's what these first generation vaccines do. And, and so I think that that's a misplaced idea that somehow COVID can become like measles. It can't. Uh, COVID can't become like polio. These are different types of viruses with different biological characteristics. And, and COVID comes from a family of viruses that cause 25% of our common colds. Uh, so this is going to become a seasonal coronavirus, a seasonal cold virus. And the goal is to tame it by getting more people immune to its, to its serious effects. And that's what the vaccine does in the safest manner possible. Is it necessary for people who've already had COVID to get vaccinated? Say you've had COVID twice. So what we know is that natural immunity is something that's real. It does protect you against reinfection, especially in the early months after your, in, after your initial bout with the virus. It probably does protect you from getting serious illness. But the problem with natural immunity, or and I don't even like the word natural immunity because all immunity, you can get immunity from the vaccine too, that's natural as well. But the, the immunity from prior infection, we don't know how robust it is in terms of how long it lasts, how predictable it is, because some people have very high immunity after infection, some people have very low. And its ability to fend off some of the variants has been called into question, uh, specifically with the South African variant, which was the, the beta variant. So what I recommend is that people who've had prior infection just get a single dose of vaccine. That's enough to top off your immunity to make you probably one of the more immune people on the planet against COVID-19. And I think this is something that should be put into the guidelines. Uh, it is in guidelines in places like Israel, but it's not in the U.S. guidelines. I don't think it's in the Canadian guidelines. But there is a, a single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is available that I, I recommend often people who are vaccine hesitant because they might have had COVID and they think that their that their immunity is being ignored. I tell them, well, at least it's not being ignored. Just get one dose. And Johnson Johnson has a single dose vaccine. So you get your vaccine card so you can be called fully vaccinated and you get the benefit or the boost that that one dose of vaccine will give your pre-existing immunity. Do you think that the, so most people I know in Canada, I'm from Canada, have Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, which is two dose. And there's, I guess, I don't know, uh, the, on the news, you can see that potentially it's going to require boosters. So do you think this, this is going to be something that's like the flu vaccine that you get once a year or you get every six months or something in order to keep COVID less virulent, I guess? It really goes back to what we want the vaccine to do. And like I said earlier, that what we want to do with this vaccine or what I want the vaccine to do is prevent serious disease, hospitalization and death. And when you look at people who got the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, we haven't really seen erosion against the protection against serious disease except for in some special groups. So those above the age of 65, those with high-risk conditions. So that's where I think boosters benefit the most, are people who are above 65, people with high-risk conditions. For an average healthy person, I don't think boosters with these vaccines that we have now really do anything, but maybe push off a breakthrough infection sometime into the future. And I don't think that chasing mild infections and in healthy people with boosters makes a, a lot of sense. And maybe in Canada, you won't need boosters as much because you separated the dose. I think some of there was separation in doses a little bit longer than in the US where we separated Pfizer by three and Moderna by four. In Canada, there was a little bit longer duration, I think because of supply issues, but that actually makes the vaccines work better. So hopefully there's not as much of a need for boosters. 
Oh, with, but, but I don't think that, uh, I think when we talk about the trajectory of the pandemic, boosting people to stop mild illness isn't going to really change the, the trajectory. It's first and second doses that are the most important. And, and I think that the boosters are a little bit of a distraction. Although if you're in a high risk group or elderly, I do think you would benefit from a booster. Um, um, one of the arguments I've heard put forth by anti-vaccine proponents was that there are more deaths in the last year, uh, vaccine related deaths than there have been ever before. Have you heard anything about this? That idea stems from people misinterpreting this database called VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse of Injury Reporting System that the CDC has set up. This is basically a catch-all reporting system that anybody, you, me, anybody can just report any any reaction that they might have had after the vaccine. And that's used basically to look and see, is there a signal there for anything? And people are looking at that raw data of people who happen to die after getting the vaccine and saying, there's a lot more of them. But the thing is, the CDC is telling people, report everything there because we want everyone to have transparency, that everybody's looking for safety signals. And when you actually adjudicate the deaths that are being reported in the VAERS system, they're not related to the vaccine uh, to a high degree. And, and I think that this is a misuse of that database, which is meant for researchers to basically sift through reams of data and try and figure out what is a causal relationship between the vaccine and some side effect and what is a correlation. Remember, just because something happens after you were vaccinated doesn't mean it was caused by the vaccine. And that's something that is being lost when people actually report, look at that database without any training, without any understanding of its context, and then just quote those numbers out of, uh, out, out of completely out of context and then use that against the vaccine and against vaccine safety when that whole system is meant to be vaccine safe, uh, a vac vaccine safety system. So this is uh, one area that's very frustrating that this, that those numbers keep getting quoted out of context and, and cited as if they're actually causally linked to the vaccine. Okay. That's a fair response. I think I have one more major question. Um, this is another argument that's frequently brought up by the anti-vaccine community, uh, community, is that vaccine companies, pharmaceutical companies, don't have a liability protection, but they have liability protection if they can mandate vaccines in kids. Apparently, once a vaccination is mandated in children, and that would be through the government, they get liability protection. Do you know anything about that? So this goes back to a little bit what we were talking about with the vaccine court. So first of all, in the United States, no vaccines are mandated as a condition of life for children. There are school requirements that are, those are different. And then there is a pan, there is the CDC, which recommends vaccines. So what happens is when the CDC officially recommends a vaccine saying, this is something that children should get, that gets, that gives a vaccine a certain status. It doesn't mean that it's mandated because not every child is vaccinated against measles or influenza, for example, but they're also they're all recommended to be vaccinated. That allows that that vaccine court to they, that vaccine court to be triggered. So it's not as if they have complete that there's no recourse if someone gets a vaccine injury. It's just that it moves to that vaccine court. And, and that's where that the, this type of issue is handled versus in the open court, which maybe, for example, if you get a vaccine, that's not recommended or not approved or, or not, doesn't have that same level of evidence behind it, you might go through the traditional courts. Maybe it's a travel vaccine or some, or a vaccine or, or a vaccine that's not recommended for the general public and you get that, then you probably have a different, there's a different pathway. But once something is endorsed by the CDC as a recommendation is put on the childhood recommended vaccines, which are not the same as mandates, then I think you use you use that other alternative court system. Obviously, I'm not a public health lawyer in, in, in some of these, um, some of the details I might be a little bit off on, but that's my best understanding of it. I've heard that there's a link, and I don't know if this is true again, between chicken pox and shingles, that you get the chicken pox vaccine as a kid, you have immunity, but it only lasts seven to 10 years, then you're not immune anymore. And because you don't have that natural childhood immunity, you can grow up and you can end up with shingles, which is way worse. Um, and apparently they don't vaccinate against chickenpox in the UK. And that has something to do with the fact that people might get shingles when they're later because they don't have the initial immunity to chickenpox because the chickenpox vaccine wears off. How do you feel about that? It's a little bit jumbled up there. So I'm going to try and I'm going to kind of give you okay, a chickenpox good luck. One, one lesson. So chickenpox and shingles are caused by the same virus. So when you get chickenpox, you don't, if you get chickenpox, you get infected with chickenpox, that virus, it never leaves your body. It's actually part of the herpes virus family. So herpes viruses stay with you for life. Chickenpox stays with you for life. 
So you get infected, you get the chicken pox, you get the rash, people get that as a child. Then years later, decades later, as you get older, that virus reawakens. It might reawaken because you're older, it might reawaken because you're on immunosuppressants or you get ill or you have trauma or something and you get shingles. That's So that's the relationship. You get chicken pox as a child, it reactivates later in life as shingles. And what, what happened was they developed a chicken pox vaccine. So that actually aborts the entire process because you don't get infected with chicken pox. So then therefore you don't get shingles. So it it's actually the exact opposite of the way it was presented to you. So the chicken pox vaccine is something that would prevent you from getting shingles because if you don't get chicken pox, you cannot get shingles. And the vaccine seems to be very robust. Uh, we give it in two doses. And, there, and, and for people who like me who got chicken pox, I got infected with chicken pox when I was in eighth grade, I'm at risk for shingles. When I get to a certain age, there's another vaccine, a shingles vaccine that you can take to prevent that reactivation or that reawakening that occurs. So it's actually the other way around. And I think that the chickenpox vaccine is likely to change the way shingles occurs because it's gonna become less common because it's not something that's out there anymore because people aren't getting infected with chickenpox. So th this, is, uh, this is puzzling to me that people have, put, have, have used this against the chickenpox vaccine, because it's actually probably the exact opposite of the truth. Hmm. Uh, is the shingles vaccine just the chickenpox vaccine? Is it the same thing? It's very similar to the chickenpox vaccine, but it's a higher dose uh, vaccine than the chickenpox vaccine. Okay. 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 I think those are all the questions I had. Do you have anything else you want to add? Just that I think it's, it's incredible how many vaccines that we do have and how vaccines have really added decades of life to every person and prevented hundreds of millions of deaths. I think that they're technological marvels. And I think it's to me mind boggling to see people turn against what's one of the, you know, the pillars of what's made, you know, our, our, our childhoods, something that are idyllic and not fraught with hearing about our friends with measles or our friends dying, or our friends in, in hospitals. And people in Africa line up overnight just to get access to certain vaccines that we take for granted, like the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And, and I think it's just, uh, to me, a very sad state of affairs when we see people uh, turning away from what I think are, are, are life-enhancing products that, that everyone benefits from. Okay. Where can people find you online or where should they go if they want to learn more? Uh, the best way to interact with me or to follow me is on Twitter. It's at Amish AA, so A-M-E-S-H-A-A. -A. Great. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you.